Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Healthcare and the ADA Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities webinar series. I am Pam Williamson, and I am your moderator for today. The series of webinars are brought to you by the Pacific ADA Center on behalf of the ADA National Network. The ADA National Network is made up of 10 regional centers that are federally funded to provide training, technical assistance, and other information on the Americans with Disabilities Act. You may reach your regional ADA center by calling 1-800-949-4232. Next slide, please. Just a few housekeeping issues as we get started today. Our real-time captioning is being provided for this webinar and the caption screen can be accessed by choosing the CC icon and the meeting control bar. And you can also toggle the meeting control bar permanently on by pressing the Alt key once and then press the Alt key a second time. Captioning may also be accessed via a stream text link that will be put in the chat area. As always, during our sessions, only speakers will have audio today. The rest of you will be able to communicate with us through the chat function. Next slide, please. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer or you prefer to listen by phone, you may, may dial 1-669-900-9126. Eight six five six. You will need to enter the webinar ID 837-2204-3591. Please note that this is not a toll-free number. The series will be able to be accessed, um, is being recorded and will be able to be accessed at www.adapresentations.org website at the archive at sometime next week. Next slide, please. Great. This webinar series is intended to share issues and promising practices in healthcare accessibility for people with disabilities. The series topic, topics cover physical accessibility, effective communication, and reasonable modification of policy issues under the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Upcoming sessions are available at www.adapresentations.org under the Schedule tab. Then you must follow to healthcare. These webinars occur every other month on the fourth Thursday of the month at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 1.30 p.m. Central Time, 12.30 p.m. Mountain Time, and 11.30 a.m. Pacific Time. By being here, you are on the list to receive notices for future webinars in this series, and the notices go out two weeks before the next webinar and open that webinar to registration. You can follow along on the webinar platform with the slides, or if you're not using the webinar platform, you may download a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation at the Healthcare Schedule webpage at www.adapresentations.org. At the conclusion of today's presentations, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. You may submit your questions using the chat area within the webinar platform. The speakers and I will address them at the end of the session, so feel free to submit them as they come to your mind during the presentation. Again, as you submit your questions, you may type and submit them in the chat area box or press Alt-H and enter text in the chat area. And if you are listening by phone and not logged into the webinar, you may ask questions by emailing them to ADA Tech. T-E-C-H at adapacific.org. Next slide, please. If you experience any difficulties during, technical difficulties during the webinar, please send a private chat message to the host by typing in the chat window, type your comment in the text box and enter, and, and enter, and, or you can use the keyboard with Alt-H to access the chat box via keyboard keys. 
You may also email ADATECH, ADA Tech at adapacific.org or call 510-831-6714. Next slide, please. And now I am excited to welcome you to our learning session titled State of the Equitable Care for Persons with Disabilities 50 Years After Civil Rights Laws. Despite multiple laws requiring the provision of equitable care, research repeatedly demonstrates that Americans with disabilities experience disparities and inadequate care. Today's presenters will discuss major areas in which these disparities persist, data gaps, effective communication, physical access to care, competency training for healthcare providers and staff, and non-discriminatory health insurance benefit design. In each of these areas, the presenters will discuss the current status of the field and promising future directions or solutions. Today's speakers are Dr. Megan Morris, and she is an associate professor at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus and the Director of the Disability Equity Collaborative. The aim of her research is to advance the equity of care delivered to persons with disabilities. We also welcome Dr. Michelle Mead, who is a full professor in the Departments of Physical Medicine, Rehabilitation and Family Medicine at the University of Michigan slash Michigan Medicine. She is the co-director of the University of Michigan Center for Disability Health and Wellness and the pr principal investigator on the IDEAL RRTC, the Equity and Health and Functioning RRTC, and the Michigan SCI model systems. Dr. Mead's research is twofold in working to identify and enhance individual self-management while also collaborating to identify and address systemic and environmental factors that contribute to healthcare disparities among individuals with disabilities, and particularly those from racially and ethnically marginalized and underrepresented populations. And last but not least, we also have Elizabeth Pendo, a professor of law at St. Louis University School of Law and Center for Health Law Studies. She uses a disability justice framework to study the impact of healthcare and anti-discrimination discrimination laws on health outcomes and experiences with people with disabilities. Now, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our speakers and um, we look forward to your presentation today. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the, um, that introduction. Um, my name is Megan Morris. I will get us started today. We have some slides to present, um, but we're going to take some pauses um, during our presentation for for questions amongst the the panel and then we'll we have allowed plenty of time at the end for uh, discussion questions so feel free to uh, send your questions along the way so the the paper that we will be discussing today or the presentation is based off a paper that was published um, last fall in the uh, disability and health issue of health affairs and I would like to acknowledge our our co-authors, uh, Dr. Lisa Iazzoni and uh, Dr. Um, uh, Mike McKee. So, and the the link to the paper is in the chat. Um, all right. So, next slide. So, just to set the stage, I I think this is probably knowledge that many, if not all of you, know. Um, the research has demonstrated over and over that individuals with disabilities across different types of disabilities experience disparities in the receipt of health and healthcare services. And this can lead to poor health and healthcare outcomes. Uh, so I'm giving a few examples here. Again, this is just a little uh, taste of, of, again, the, the vast uh, amount of research there is around the disparities um, experienced by individuals with disabilities. So. We know that individuals with, uh, with physical um, or cognitive disabilities have much higher rates of diabetes, 2.7 times, and higher rates of heart disease, three times, as compared to individuals without disabilities. In the recent COVID-19 um, epidemic uh, pandemic, 
there was a study that demonstrated that individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities were six times more likely uh, to die from, from COVID-19 when they contracted it as compared to, again, individuals without disabilities who contracted COVID-19. We know that our healthcare facilities, and we'll go more into this, are not accessible. Um, the, as, our, uh, as a consequence of, for example, um, exam tables not being accessible, um, women with, with disabilities, particularly uh, physical disabilities, have much lower rates of preventative cancer screenings as compared to women without disabilities. We know that despite having high rates of insurance that many people um, with disabilities, in this case, one in three people with communication-related disabilities, um, reported difficulty finding a provider who would see them. And then finally, our last graphic here is that individuals with communication-related disabilities um, were three times more likely to experience a preventable adverse event in the hospital, um, again, as compared to individuals without disabilities. Next slide, please. We know that there's a wide range of social, personal, environmental factors that, that contribute to the, the poor health and healthcare outcomes of individuals with disabilities. On the slide, I, prevented, I presented a few examples of, um, that again have been de demonstrated in the, in the literature. So decreased access to exercise opportunities, poor social support, lack of accessible housing, low social economic status, decreased access to employment. And then what we'll be talking about today is disparities in quality and access to health care. So again, I just wanted to acknowledge all of the, the diverse social, personal, environmental factors that are, that are out there. But again, today we'll be focusing on um, the health and healthcare system. Next slide, please. As was mentioned, there are multiple federal laws that require provision of equal care to individuals with disabilities, starting with the Rehab Act of 1973, um, which was then uh, further reinforced with Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990. And then most recently, the Affordable Care Act of 2010 does, um, again, reinforce in some cases expand the requirements for provision of equal care to individuals with disabilities. So you'll hear throughout our presentation today. So despite uh, these three laws that have been around um, for decades, we still see pretty significant disparities um, and challenges with accessing high quality healthcare services. Next slide. Last February, so February of 2022, the National Council on Disability released a health equity framework for people with disabilities. And in this, this framework, this report, they reported five different areas um, that were, again, core components for health equity for individuals with disabilities. So first was designating people with disabilities as a, a special medically underserved population. Second, designating people with disabilities as a health disparity population. Three, improving data collection. Four, requiring use of accessible medical and diagnostic equipment. And five, requiring comprehensive disability clinical care curriculum. We will be covering um, three through five in this list, plus we have added effective communication and also non-discriminatory uh, private health insurance benefit design. So that will be what we'll be covering in today's talk. Next slide. Can I just stop? I think it's worth also adding that, you know, increasingly the executive orders coming out of the Biden administration have identified individuals with disabilities as um, a medically underserved population. And that is uh, definitely a population that needs to be uh, included and addressed with any diversity initiatives. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, one piece that I wanted to to mention, uh, because I think it's it's a theme throughout what we talked about today, is the issue of ableism and structural ableism. 
Um, so ableism is discrimination, social prejudice against persons with disabilities in favor of those who are able-bodied. And then structural ableism is the laws, policy, institutional practices, and entrenched norms that create and perpetuate ableism. And um, again, I, I think a theme of what we'll be talking about today is, is yes, again, these laws have been in place, but why, why have we seen more movement forward? And I would put out there that I think um, underlying a lot of the lack of movement and sort of the consistent and um, disparities that are out there for individuals with disabilities really is is rooted in uh, in ableism and structural ableism. So I just wanted to call that out and name that um, as we're we're going through our our talk today. And I'm sorry, if I can also add to that, I think these are particularly problematic when it comes to healthcare systems. Medical systems are really, I think, torn between seeing individuals as patients and of people, once again, medical model, they have to be cured. Um, therefore, the physicians, the healthcare provider is the one with the expertise and individuals who are active um, collaborators, both in their own healthcare as well as uh, employees, faculty members, leaders within the healthcare systems, and that I think these, you know, this tension very much underlies where um, the the processes are and how uh, you know these topics don't get sufficiently addressed. Absolutely, absolutely. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna begin um, talking about our, our data needs. So next slide. So we can't improve what we don't measure. And unfortunately, historically, um, we have not been doing a good job of capturing who has a disability. So this starts with in our public health data, um, we need in national surveys to be documenting who has a disability so we can track um, uh, quality of health and healthcare again at a population level. We can monitor trends and then we can make informed policy decisions and changes. And then at a healthcare organization level, so this is often discussed in terms of documenting disability in the electronic health record. And uh, again, this has not been uh, done historically. It is still rarely, rarely done in the healthcare setting. And we, we really need to, to be documenting, capturing a person's disability status in the electronic health record for several reasons. First, monitoring the quality of health and healthcare at an organization level. If we are implementing equity initiatives and in our interventions, we need to be able to, one, direct those to individuals with disabilities, and then be able to measure the effects of those interventions. And then three uh, is, again, we'll talk about how persons with disabilities are, um, due to the federal laws, are, are required to be uh, provided healthcare accommodations. Well, you don't know who needs an accommodation if you don't actually first start by asking um, who has a disability. And so I'm going to jump in here because I know, Dr. Morris, you're, you're doing a lot of work in this area. Can you say what are the best practices as related to this and what initiatives you're working on? Yeah, yeah. So if we go to the next slide. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we're working on. Um, so uh, like Michelle mentioned, I've been talking and thinking about this topic for a very long time, for over a decade now, and um, have spent a lot of time talking with, with health systems and with patients and with researchers um, and policymakers, et cetera, about this topic. And as we all know, disability, um, it is challenging to, to measure, to document, um, because there are many different definitions of disability. And again, going back to the, the foundation and ableism, there has been also stigma associated with identifying as disabled. And so 
Um, so one of the first questions I have gotten uh, from health systems is, well, what do patients think about this? And so we have done some research with patients, surveys, lots of qualitative work, and generally patients are pretty supportive. And they say things like, well, you're already asking me some pretty personal questions when I go to the doctor. Um, so it's okay if you ask me if I have a hearing loss. Um, I, I want my team to know this information. Um, and so they just want to know that the healthcare system is using that data in a um, conscious way, uh, not using it to, again, discriminate, but using it to inform provision of equal care. Um, the next question I often get from health systems is saying, well, but are, are we legally even like allowed to ask people if they have a disability? And the, the answer is yes. And there are some, um, some specifically section uh, 4302 of the Affordable Care Act talks about documenting um, different demographic characteristics, race and ethnicity, primary language, and disability status for the purpose of tracking disparities, okay? We um, have also done some research talking with, again, diverse stakeholders saying, what are your pri priorities for advancing equitable care for people with disabilities? And our number one priority across all of our different stakeholders, again, policymakers, health systems, patients, um, researchers, and consistent documentation of disability status in the electronic health record is identified consistently as the top research and policy prior priority. So, uh, so what's going on um, currently? And what we know is that um, health systems are struggling to implement, um, partly because there hasn't been, again, um, information on how to best do this um, in terms of best practices, um, research to inform, how do you train your staff and who should be asking, um, et cetera. So if you could go to the next slide. But we have had some recent um, developments in policies, specifically um, July of last year, the Office for the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, um, or information, um, information technology, so ONC, they are the federal body that oversees electronic health records, and they released requirements um, for interoperability for standardized disability data elements. And so what this says is that all electronic health records have to have a place um, where you can input disability status. Now, it doesn't say um, to the healthcare systems, you need to be using that field, but it really, again, their purview is just the, the electronic health record companies and the, the platforms, okay? So in response to that, um, as part of what we have, um, the Disability Equity Collaborative, we have a work group on documenting disability status. Again, really diverse uh, stakeholders involved. If you're interested in participating, everyone is welcome. Um, just go to our website, disabilityequitycollaborative.org. And we put together a, a user guide on documenting disability status in electronic health record. It's a, here's where you get started. Um, it doesn't have all the answers by, by any means, but at least it, it um, takes from learning from, again, health systems that are currently working on it um, and puts it one place. Um, and so it, again, hopefully is a helpful guide for health systems getting started. I hope that answered your question, Michelle. <laughs> Sorry, it does. I would also like to add, if possible, some of the work that we're doing here at the University of Michigan. Um, and so um, the I put an article in the chat from our end, and hopefully it'll be advanced about a recent article published in JMIR about the disability and accommodations field. Right. So our accessibility task force is working on a, a field with and questionnaire within EPIC that can be pushed to patients to ask about not only disability and disability ac accommodations. You know, once again, having that knowledge beforehand so that practical steps can be taken. This is, um, you know, once again, problematic because you have 
there's the questions about do people actually identify as having a disability, especially older adults, and how is that seen? There's the question about do the clinics actually know how to provide these accommodations? And then another issue that's coming up is who is responsible and who needs to know this information as the patient comes in? During COVID, this was particularly relevant um, when people were screening and not allowing folks in who did not have masks. Um, and so it wasn't so much the front desk or the providers themselves who needed some pre-information to let them know, uh, maybe language, communication issues, but the, you know, the check, the folks checking people in or screening. Um, at that clinic level. And so uh, a lot, lot of important work. Um, the, ha the best practices, I think it's so exciting that you're working on this, that there's more work going on at the federal level. But, you know, I think it comes down to then the commitment of each healthcare system to pay, as you said, to pay attention to it and to use it to check on the quality of their care, just as they do issues of gender or race. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, um, I agree with, and if I could just add, there's yeah. other legal levers we can use to encourage this on the federal level. Um, and there's starting to be more activity in that area. But as Megan mentioned, section 4302 of the Affordable Care Act requires that this information be collected and that we use a standardized definition, there's actually another provision in that same area of the law that requires collection of disability specific information. Where do people with disabilities go to get care? What barriers do they experience there? And who has accessible spaces um, and training? Um, so it's right there as a requirement. It hasn't been funded and it hasn't been collected. So I think there is you know, an opportunity to coordinate with healthcare systems in terms of collection of this information using these best practices. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I will also add uh, one of the challenges thus far in the ONC um, changes really helped prompt this is also coming from the, the electronic health record vendors. Um, so one of the challenges organizations have is that each person has to, or each organization has to develop their own fields and de develop their own um, systems. And so we are actually um, working with um, Epic, one of the largest um, EHR vendors. Um, and we currently have a, a grant funded through the National Institutes of Health to actually test method, develop met methods and de develop a, a build for electronic health records that will be um, starting in the fall testing uh, to, to demonstrate can, can these methods effectively, again, consistently get disability in electronic health record and then also consistently um, uh, link documentation of disability status to provision of accommodations. Ladies, this is Pam. We've been asked if you could slow down just a little bit because we've got such a lot of information. So folks are wanting to make sure they're processing it. All right, right, will do. Thank you. Thanks. All right, next slide. So now I'm going to move uh, to effective communication. So next slide. Again, as I'm sure many of you on the call know, uh, there is a federal requirement for provision of uh, effective communication through um, provision of accommodation or auxiliary aids and services. And in the healthcare setting, this um, means a wide range of, of communication from uh, oral communication with any member of the team, um, your healthcare team, written communication, so patient education materials, after visit summaries, et cetera. Um, and then telecommunication methods um, and electronic method, uh, methods. And I think one key piece that really needs to be um, explored and is the access to um, both telehealth and then off also um, 
patient portals, because those um, are often ways that healthcare teams are now communicating with, with patients. And so um, more work needs to be done on making sure those platforms are accessible to individuals with, with disabilities. Next slide. Just, I'm sorry, I think that's just important in terms of noting not only the um, communication as related to sensory disabilities, um, which is definitely uh, probably was more of an issue earlier in the pandemic, and they've done more problem solving related to that, but those with cognitive uh, impairments as well, and IDD, um, the idea of the using platforms, using systems, having protocols that allow for access. Um, and then of course, social determinants of health, just to provide internet access um, and training as related to and tailored training, given the individual's background and abilities um, for each this important healthcare tool. Absolutely. Yes, and on the issue of web access, just something to keep our eye on, um, the Department of Justice has said that they will be developing um, legally enforceable standards for what does it mean for a website to be accessible. Um, this is an issue with equipment too, as we'll hear. It's one thing to say it must be accessible. It's another thing to develop technical standards that are legally enforceable that tell everyone what it means um, for it to be accessible. We have voluntary standards for um, accessibility of websites, but we don't have any legally enforceable standards yet. There's been a suggestion that they're going to be developed, but that process hasn't started yet, but it's definitely something important to watch that impacts a lot of areas, but including healthcare. Absolutely, that's that's uh, great to hear, Elizabeth. I um, um, recently was involved in a case that's public out there, so I can talk about it, but um, it's Boone versus um, University of North Carolina. Um, and it was a lawsuit brought by patients with visual disabilities and their lack of um, sort of, again, provision of effective communication. And uh, I will say that the federal judge did question, what are the standards out there for uh, for websites? And it is, it is, it, it's a, it's a problem of, again, who, who sets the standards and right now without any federal sort of oversight on that, it's really left up to, um, in this case, healthcare organizations to define what that is. Um, I just really wanted to quickly just throw up there that there are uh, lots of research around um, effective communication and that when um, patients do not receive effective communication, and this is really any patient, that there's a whole host of uh, poor health and healthcare outcomes. So, you know, poor adherence to treatments, patient dissatisfaction, and lack of trust in providers. And then, but when there is a effective communication, we see again, improved outcomes, um, increased adherence, um, less utilization of the healthcare. So if you understand when you go to the emergency room, what is being uh, told to you, you can go home, follow the treatment recommendations, and you're less likely to, to need to come back into the hospital. But I think this also then overlaps with the later topic in terms of the pro provider training, you know, and this isn't just training in terms of specific types of knowledge, it's really trying to do diversity training and address the attitudinal environment, address the implicit biases that people have, the ableism, the structural ableism that is present um, and that, you know, results in providers not asking about uh, key areas of people's lives because they don't either value those or they don't think that individuals with disabilities are operating or interacting in those spaces. Absolutely. Next slide. So as we mentioned, um, research has shown over and over, um, and I think many of us could sit here and tell horror stories of the lack of provision of, of 
you know, effective communication, and really sometimes it's not even effective communication, any communication that, you know, um, I mean, I can just talk from my own personal family experience of family member who um, had a disability, was in the hospital, um, was tied down, not given a nurse call light, and was unable to, because of a mouth con condition, verbally communicate, and was left like that for days. I mean, that's that's not just effective communication. That's basic uh, communication. Um, and then on the other side, which um, again, Michelle will talk about a little bit later, is that healthcare teams report being unprepared and uncertain how best to communicate with patients with disabilities. And it goes back to that training. All right, next slide. So we, we do know um, that evidence-based solutions exist. So we do know that accommodations do improve quality of communication. Um, I will do a shout out to uh, Dr. Jan Blues, Blue Stein um, at NYU and her colleagues recently had a paper uh, that demonstrated uh, in the emergency room when they provided um, personal assistive listening devices to patients with disabilities, um, with hearing disabilities, that they saw a decrease in repeat visits to the emergency room. So again, these combinations can improve quality of care. Um, and then we also know that there's a range of communication strategies that the healthcare team can use. So these not, aren't just, here's an accommodation I'm gonna hand you, but this is how I'm gonna adapt how I communicate with you. And it's looking at the patient while speaking, using short phrases and sentences, et cetera. Um, but again, they're not being consistently used um, by healthcare teams, often due to lack of um, education and awareness, and many cases, biases. Next slide. So I often get the question of, of okay, why aren't healthcare organizations um, providing accommodations, providing effective communication? And I put this, this diagram here. The, this is what I've, we've done interviews with lots of health systems, and this is many of the main barriers they are reporting experiencing. So the first is you have to convince your leadership um, and your providers and your staff on the need and importance for documenting disability status, providing accommodations, um, providing education to your staff, et cetera. Um, and this is where oftentimes attitudes, um, negative attitudes and biases and ableism is coming in. Um, again, I can tell you stories of, um, uh, you know, quotes from leadership saying, you know, that they would rather just pay out ADA lawsuits than even think about trying to be accessible um, for patients with disabilities and, um, and complaining that most people with disabilities are faking their disabilities. So why should we worry about providing them um, accommodations, et cetera? And this is, I think, one of the areas which to me is mind blowing because it's this tension of many of our, the people who receive care at healthcare systems, especially in multiple ways, have either temporary or permanent disabilities. And so it would seem to make sense that if we're going to improve population health, if we're going to really provide the best possible care to everyone, that even if it's just as patients and not as individuals with disabilities, that we think about the accommodations and strategies. Um, and so the ableism and just the, the lack of awareness about, I think, this population is, this is where it comes in, that we don't have the numbers. We can't provide the specific data about the effect this is having on our costs. Yes, what, uh, what both my fellow panelists are saying is so important. And part of it is the process that you see here on the slide that too often in the within the healthcare system, disability 
rights, the right to accommodation, effective communication, et cetera, and patient outcomes are seen as, or quality of care are seen as separate. Legal requirements are seen as another thing that has to be thought about on top of providing high quality care to patients. But in fact, they're deeply, deeply related. And part of that is like bridging different cultures of law, of medicine, of public health, you know, in different areas and understanding how to communicate the idea that uh, respecting the rights of your patients with disabilities is inherently linked to providing quality care and pursuing the best outcomes. They are not separate. Um, and I think that's why we'd have to think very carefully about what type of education and training is provided and are these connections made and is it made by, with, for people with disabilities? Absolutely. All right. So I'm going to move on to the next slide and with that, turn it over to my co-panelist, uh, Michelle. Um, we may want to go back some. Yeah, hold on one moment. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Many of these topics, you know, we've already talked about, and we we've heard that the the physical access to care um, isn't you know isn't there. And if you want to go over to the next slide, um, that you have both the challenges of getting to healthcare environments, um, particularly that are more problematic for individuals with mobility impairments, whether it is because of the ability to get transportation, the ability to have someone else take time off to go with you, um, just being able to have routes or parking spots, as well as, um, you know, the problems with the healthcare environment themselves. The ADA has definitely improved um, the structural environments that are at healthcare facilities. Um, but while there have been attempts to uh, standardize and implement the real legal guidelines related to the equipment, those haven't been well integrated or uptake. And even when they are there, the lack of training by providers means that they're not being used. Um, and so, you know, once again, the ACA um, mandated uh, the involvement of accessibility boards to try and um, create standards for accessible testing, accessible um, environments, uh, sorry, ex ex exam tables, uh, and you can just go through, but without both a follow-up um, about who has this, without enforcement, without the knowledge about how to use them, and then without funding. And so for the federally qualified health centers and other facilities to um, purchase and implement them, we, you're just continuing to have problems. Um, and so with individuals with disabilities, with physical impairments, sometimes it's just a matter of getting in the door. Um, health, larger healthcare systems um, in more urban environments are often better, although once again, access to care as associated to insurance may be more problematic there. In rural areas, in areas where folks are repurposing houses, other structures, um, those adaptations that are needed uh, to get people in the door, to get them in the table, on the table are problematic. Um, with the physical aspect of care, you very much have uh, issue of who's required to provide it. And so even within large healthcare systems, which large budgets, you know, clinics and practitioners often think on the individual level. I don't have time to do that right now. I don't have immediate access to that. And so we're not responsible for it. So I think in terms of convincing healthcare systems and investing in this, sometimes it is a matter of you know, both connecting it to patient outcomes and connecting it. I don't, um, I don't know about financial ones. Uh, that your uh, comment, uh, Megan, about 
would rather pay out those ADA lawsuits is really disturbing. Elizabeth, do you have specific thoughts about the legal components of the physical environment? Um, yes, uh, as you mentioned, we it's one thing to require physical accessibility, which of course, you know, these laws do. But having those standardized requirements that everyone knows how to follow, you know, even it let's imagine that you are a provider, you're the person who buys equipment for the for the provider practice. And you you actually are aware of these laws and you want to have accessible exam tables and chairs and scales and imaging equipment. How would you know exactly what that is? You know, that's why the standards are really important. They were developed by the Access Board, but as Michelle mentioned, they have not yet been adopted as legally enforceable regulations. Again, that process is, there's been um, some signals that that process is gonna start, um, but it hasn't happened yet. And part of that is because there are so many priorities that the Office, Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Justice has, even in the area of healthcare, let alone all the other areas of disability rights, that they're kind of working through these priorities um, as quickly as they can. Uh, but it takes a while for that to be adopted. I did see that there's a proposed bill, it's come out in a couple different forms that, that is going to increase the tax credit. So mm -hmm. when providers or any kind of small business purchases or expends money to make things more accessible, they can get a pretty significant tax credit. And there's a bill to increase both who can request that and, and the amount of it, which hopefully will address some of the concerns about the cost because medical equipment can be quite costly. I think that's a great point. Um, I see there's a comment in the chat about we're talking about more than physical disability access, um, the communication access tools for people with behavioral health issues. Um, I think that's a, a combination of um, you know, the communication uh, guidelines and tools that we talked about, uh, having spaces which allow individuals with cognitive and behavioral issues um, to receive health care in an environment that facilitates communication and which allows for appropriate connections, um, which allows them to, to really feel comfortable and safe within those settings. Um, and it also relates to the issue of disability training. You know, that we have healthcare providers that um, aren't sure how to handle uh, anyone with a disability. They, uh, they would rather avoid it sometimes. And um, either because of the time involved um, or just because of implicit bias and fears. Um, that someone's not going to interact in a certain way, or that they don't have, you know, their their quality of life isn't as good anyway, or that they don't really need this. It's, you know, the COVID pandemic really demonstrated how um, implicit bias led to the denial of care. Um, and very negative outcomes. And so there is much to be done as related to some of the disability competencies. And so I can say a little bit more about that, but I know my colleagues have a lot to say in this area too. I would add that the attitudinal barriers, you know, stereotypes and assumptions, and even just lack of knowledge becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I've definitely talked to providers who say, that's interesting information to know, but it's not a problem here because we don't have any patients with disabilities. And if you think one in four people in the United States, according to the CDC, have some kind of disability, of course, every provider should expect to see many different, many people with many different kinds of disabilities. But it may be that if you, if you don't have the knowledge, if your space isn't accessible, if you don't have the practices and policies, if you don't understand how to provide accommodations, then patients with disabilities may not feel comfortable coming to you. And then that reinforces the belief that this isn't necessary. It's sort of the same um, cycle that we experienced back in the 1970s when people with disabilities were you know, unnecessarily institutionalized. 
that let people who weren't institutionalized believe that integrating people with disabilities into all aspects of community life wasn't difficult or perhaps wasn't as necessary because a whole group of people were removed from community life. So if these barriers are such that people with disabilities are not comfortable um, going to providers who they don't believe have you know, the disability cultural competence or knowledge to treat them, then it's going to be another barrier um, to get that developed in those practices. And so I'll just say one more thing in terms about the, the disability training, because I do think, at least at my institution, I'm seeing some inclusion of disability as a diversity or a component. And while it's definitely there, um, within that context, it's missing some practical supports and uh, guidelines, tip sheets, best, you know, about how to really tailor care for individuals with disabilities that go beyond the attitudinal environment. Um, yes, and going there, back to Megan's point in the beginning about this works on both an individual and a structural level. It's not a problem solely created by individual providers, right? And so it's yeah. not a problem that they can necessarily solve on their own. So understanding how both on the in the interpersonal patient care level, but also the systemic level, who buys the equipment, who's responsible for, even in an accessible building, you can have stacks of things and equipment that in hallways that make it inaccessible. You know, how is the entire healthcare organization arranged around ensuring that people with disabilities can access care? Right, and that then provides both to patients as well as providers with disabilities. The idea is that there's more work in the area to bring diversity to our workforce, um, and that will help improve care. Um, I know that Elizabeth still has to present her slides, so why don't we move on to those? See how far we are going. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay, I'm going to switch gears a tiny bit and talk about something that is related, and that is disparities in health insurance coverage, right? Um, as Megan mentioned at the top of the presentation, people with disabilities do have high rates of insurance, but there's a question to be explored about what type of insurance, because there's a large body of research showing that um, there are favored and disfavored forms of insurance among certain providers. So next slide, please. Let's see, okay, here's just some basic information, right? This was in the paper, you might be familiar with this. If we're talking about private health insurance, that's health insurance that you get through work or maybe that you purchase on the marketplace or it could also be TRICARE. That private type of insurance, a little under half of insured individuals who are adults with disabilities had that private insurance. That's a much smaller proportion. Uh, than working age adults who do not have disabilities. Um, as you can see, it's almost 75%. And before the Affordable Care Act, I'll tell this, this story in chronological order because things have been developing and there's even more developing uh, since our paper. Before the Affordable Care Act, it was really well known that some people couldn't access insurance at all, that insurance was fragmented. If you leave a job or go on to become eligible for Medicaid or leave Medicaid and get employer-sponsored care, the system was very fragmented. People fell through the cracks and there were a lot of restrictions on coverage that left a lot of people, including a lot of people with disabilities without any coverage at all or underinsured. They had insurance, but care that they needed was excluded or limited or was subject to such high cost sharing obligations that it really was not affordable. And as a result, people with disabilities couldn't access care that they needed or medication or equipment um, or services. So that was the problem pre-Affordable Care Act. So next slide, please. Before the Affordable Care Act came the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990. And when it was first passed, uh, there was a lot of excitement um, around how it might apply to health insurance and how it might address some of these obvious problems that were mentioned in study after study and report after report. And on its face, the ADA does appear to apply robustly to insurance, right? It applies to 
um, employment discrimination. So if you get your insurance through work, you can use it to challenge uh, discrimination. And it, it also seemed to apply to public entities who were discriminating on the basis of insurance like Medicaid. Um, and Title III also applies to public accommodations, which essentially means private businesses open to the public. So there was a lot of hope that insurers who offered these insurance plans could be covered under Title III as public accommodations. Uh, but unfortunately, as you can see on the slide, those hopes were dashed pretty quickly, actually, um, as the ADA was applied to health insurance, but it had these really major limitations, right? Uh, before the Affordable Care Act, lots of courts said, hey, the ADA doesn't require employers to offer insurance at all. So how much ability do we have to say what they should be providing, right? And lots of courts said, as long as they're providing everyone the exact same thing, even if it is less valuable to people with disabilities because of the way coverage is structured, that's fine under these laws. That definitely changed under the Affordable Care Act, but just talking about the ADA now. Um, some courts thought it didn't even apply to insurance, right? They thought it had to be a, a brick and mortar kind of store, a physical space um, that you could get into. And we see echoes of that, um, in, in my opinion, erroneous interpretation of the ADA echoing in a lot of the web accessibility questions that are being raised now. Does it have to be a physical space? And the biggest problem that is that the ADA had a safe harbor exception that said if, you, if it's actuarially justifiable, meaning if it makes sense cost-wise, we're gonna allow certain kinds of restrictions and exclusions, even if they disproportionately disadvantaged people with disabilities. Uh, so the ADA looked to be a powerful tool, but the way it was interpreted and, an, and a major exception of the safe harbor meant it wasn't the powerful tool to address health insurance discrimination that we hoped it could be. So let's go to the next slide. A lot of these issues were addressed by the Affordable Care Act, right? The Affordable Care Act has a lot of provisions that aren't specifically designed for people with disabilities, but are extremely beneficial to people with disabilities because it reforms insurance in lots of different ways. Um, for example, preventing exclusion of pre-existing conditions. That applies to everyone but it's particularly valuable for people with disabilities. But right now we're caught in this tug of war about how to interpret, how broadly to interpret a provision of the Affordable Care Act that prohibits discrimination. It's referred to as section 1557, because that was the section number in the original bill. And it amends existing civil rights laws, including the Rehabilitation Act, to say that you cannot discriminate on any of these bases in a wide variety of health programs and activities. Under the Obama-Biden administration in 2016, a really expansive regulation was passed. Um, it was expansive in every way, but just to mention the health insurance part, they said health insurers cannot deny or cancel or limit or refuse to issue or renew a health insurance policy. You can't deny claims on the basis of disability, you can't impose additional costs or other limitations, and you can't engage in discriminatory insurance plan benefit design. People were incredibly excited to see that because it addressed this problem, this weakness, this limitation in the ADA and said for the first time, this new provision, section 1557, was gonna prohibit health insurance. Uh, discrimination. So, you know, much rejoicing amongst uh, disability rights advocates and people involved in health equity. But then came a change in administration. Under the Trump administration, a revised rule was issued. Um, and it explicitly said it was going to significantly limit the original rule. It did so in a lot of ways, but in particular, it removed the prohibition on discriminatory plan benefit design, right? So it pulled back the protections of section 1557 so they no longer extended into health insurance. And that that is still the rule in place as of today. I checked this morning because <laughs> we're expecting a new rule at any time. 
Uh, the good news is that since our article was published, the Biden administration has proposed a new new rule. <laughs> um, and it reestablishes the really broad reach of Section 1557, including uh, the provisions related to health insurance discrimination, right? It reestablishes them. Uh, the notice and comment period has ended, so we're just waiting for the final rule to be issued. It could happen at any time, uh, but if and when it does, it is expected to do so soon. It will reestablish the anti-discrimination requirement in health insurance, and we can get to the issue of, well, what is disability discrimination in health insurance? Um, these various different rules, the 2016 rule and the 2022 rule both give some examples of what it might be. Sort of the classic example is drug tiering, right? Uh, putting different classes of drugs in different expense categories. If you put all or most drugs that are used to treat a specific disability in the highest, most expensive tier, uh, that could be seen as disability discrimination. Um, and we've seen a couple of cases, uh, an administrative charge and also a lawsuit filed um, against CVS related to this practice for putting drugs that are used to treat um, people who are HIV positive in the highest uh, cost sharing tier. So hopefully it's something to watch. Hopefully this rule becomes finalized. It'll do many things, including ban discrimination in health insurance, but then we'll see some activity around understanding and wrapping our minds around what is disability discrimination in health insurance. And I'll stop there. Thanks, uh, Elizabeth. I I have been watching this 1557 <laughs> um, uh, sort of as it has progressed. I've um, watched it for a slightly different reason. Um, I think it's under that same provision of our kind of requirement of um, not just, you know, non-discrimination. There was also language in there that said, um, healthcare entities with 15 or more employees have to designate someone as their 1557 coordinator. And so we did see, um, in sort of around that time, an increase of organizations hiring these individuals and saying, all right, you're in charge of disability, um, you know, accessibility for our organization, um, which has, I think, has been an underutilized resource in healthcare systems to providing equitable care to people with disabilities. Um, but um, yeah, I, 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 I wonder if, um, you know, once the 2022 rule comes out, if we'll see actually another sort of increase in and organizations sort of designating people to be in this role. And I would yeah. just, oh, go ahead. So even when they are there, because I know we have a 1557 coordinator, there are a lot of times putting out fires rather than doing proactive engagement. You know, the ACA also mandated the education and then the tracking of education related to disability, uh, but without follow-up you know, I don't know how many people are paying attention. I'm wondering if working on the state level um, with licensing laws may be more useful. Um, but, you know, I think for me, it's gonna be the proactive components of uh, everyone, patients and employees, having transparent processes for requesting accommodations, having someone specifically identified who can provide means um, and to hold them accountable. Right, because this idea of an ADA coordinator is not new. Section 1557, of course, covers discrimination based on race, ethnicity, national origin, sex or gender, age, and disability. So it amends you know, all of those existing um, civil rights laws. So it does uh, put all the disadvantaged groups together um, in a way which I think could be very helpful, but you're absolutely right that it's only as meaningful as it is envisioned, right? And we could have a very minimal vision of it, or we could have a very robust equity-focused vision of it. 
I also wanted to mention something else that's in 15, the 2020 proposed rule for 1557 that relates back to the data discussion we are having. Something new in that proposed rule is uh, the Office of Civil Rights um, in HHS asked for comments on algorithmic discrimination. So this idea of clinical algorithms, not that they're prohibited, but that they have to be used in connection with uh, clinical judgment rather than just adhered to and sort of acknowledging some of these data problems. Data could be biased, da data could be missing, right? As we just heard, um, data can be misleading. I think there's a false perception that using a clinical algorithm like SOFA scores or, you know, there's other types as well, as we saw during COVID-19, there's sort of a false belief that it's more objective when in fact it's just moving the judgment to somewhere else. <laughs> you know, it's moving the judgment to where the data is collected. So really important um, putting us all on notice that this is a source of possible discrimination and clinical decision-making tools are necessary and have a role but there's an obligation to ensure that they're not used in a way that results in discrimination. Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw that when the proposed rule came out and I was excited about it because I, again, during COVID-19, we, we just saw the um, crisis standards of care and sort of using these, you know, clinical algorithms to, to determine, you know, in theory, who, who uh, receives, you know, treatment who doesn't, who gets an ICU bed and who doesn't. Um, and I, I've seen some movement in um, discussing sort of algorithms and their biases for um, individuals, uh, you know, from different racial ethnic um, groups. But I, you know, it'd be great to also see um, more research and understanding how, how these sort of, again, existing um, clinical tools and algorithmic tools are, are biasing um, against people with disabilities. Yeah, I'm working on a project with a colleague who does a lot of research around prescription drug monitoring systems, which are state databases that collect information on prescription of certain kinds of drugs, including certain scheduled drugs, including opioids. And the evidence that you could look at a risk score generated by a PDMP. And of course, there's a lot of problems with how those are generated. And that could result in denying a patient care or denying them types of care that you would otherwise provide to them without sort of an individualized assessment. I think that's where disability rights law is really helpful, actually for everyone in terms of algorithmic discrimination. But you can't just take the result of the formula, right? There has to be this individualized assessment. Um, before you follow that tool. Well, ladies, this has all been wonderful information and we do have a few questions that have come in. So I would love for us to get to those uh, before the end of our session today. Uh, the first question uh, is, uh, and I, I'm hoping that one of you knows what the, the terminology is here. So this is right before COVID, I started to scratch the service, surface around AFN within my hospital system emergency management response. If you know of any work that has been done around this and can share, that would be really helpful in advancing the timeline and getting a program implemented. So any of you able to respond to that? Unfortunately, AF, AFN um, is access and functional needs. Thank you for the follow-up. Um, I know we, you know, for at the University of Michigan, it's taking a lot of passionate advocates who are working on the ground to advance rights, to connect with our leadership, um, to make some noise, to figure out where the connections are between the, uh, you know, the 1557 uh, civil rights coordinator, between ADA coordinators, between Office of Patients Experiences, and then thinking about providing the practical tips and policies. Um, it's not expecting them, the other maybe people in the system who are not as aware of disability 
to begin to try and integrate that into their understanding and policies, but creating them ourselves and offering it then as a resource. Yeah, and I'll say um, uh, at University of Colorado in our UC Health Health System, we um, we've actually had some great support from our um, equity officer. So we have a director of equity services and she gets it. She gets disability. And so that has been wonderful. And she mates with our, our system ADA coordinators on a monthly basis. And we're seeing really movement from the, the top of, um, it, again, she's rolling out initiatives around documentation of different um, demographic characteristics that, you know, like veteran status and has included disability in that. And um, so, yeah, it's it's this grassroots, but also top down um, uh, approach of getting buy in. Um, I am hopeful that um, with health systems, many are have new, new or growing equity initiatives that um, we can make sure that disability is included in those initiatives and um um yeah and that uh, we can move forward and that might be a way to get buy-in yeah and in, in terms of public health response or response in an emergency there's been a lot of great work around the inclusion of people with disabilities if you're interested in sort of framing and language i think there's a few statements on the national council for disabilities website about communication with people with disabilities during um, a pandemic or another emergency and always including people with disabilities when we think about evacuation plans or distribution of vaccines or any activity we might engage in in response to um, an emergency. And I think it's, we learned, I think some of us were not surprised by what happened during COVID-19 in terms of people with disabilities, but other people saw things um, for the first time. And I think it was a really important learning moment and not just for disability, but also for race and ethnicity and other marginalized identities. And it's really important that we not forget the lessons that we learned. There tends to be a repetitive amnesia. <laughs> we learn something and then we forget it. And then there's another pandemic and crisis standards of care all over again. So really keeping the attention um, on these issues, as my co-panelists have suggested, is really important because the time to make these plans and think through these issues is not during an emergency. It's all the time and planning ahead as much as we possibly can and not forgetting what we learned. And that segues nicely into another question that we'll have. You know, we've been talking about systems change and then a couple of you mentioned, uh, you know, the work of advocates. So what can individuals do to help push this so that um, the medical profession can better understand the disability issues? Um, I think practically in terms of when you're going in for a patient or a clinic visit, uh, give them the heads up. Let them know, you know, I have a disability, and so please be prepared to handle X, Y, and Z. Um, having that conversation, they may not be able to provide everything, but they can provide some. Continuing to advocate. Um, I think sometimes it's easier to advocate as part of an organization than as an individual. Many individuals with disabilities are afraid of alienating or losing important healthcare providers. But disability groups, I think those are great communities, both for allow for discussing, recharging, and then taking practical steps, sometimes legal steps, um, to push health systems where they need to go. We have a, a grant right now where we're testing a tool that collects patients' um, preferred communication strategies and then and then communicates that to the provider. And one of the things we found was talking with the patients is that they're making that they get nervous to say, oh, I don't want to seem like I'm being pushy or I'm demanding these communication strategies. But on the other side, when we talked to the providers, they said, oh. 
I never knew that they wanted me to use, you know, meaningful gestures while communicating. I've known this patient for years. This is really helpful. And so, um, you know, somewhat giving our, our, our providers a little bit of the benefit of the doubt of they want to do a good job. They want to communicate well. They want to provide um, accommodations to people with disabilities. They're just in a system that doesn't set them up well to do that. And so um, being, you know, um, being open to saying, hey, can I request this? This is what I need. Um, and I, I think we're all so, you know, people with disabilities, people without disabilities, we're all nervous about being labeled the, the problematic patient. But if you aren't getting your accommodations um, you need and your appointment's taking longer, then you're gonna get labeled as the problematic patient. So let's be upfront and say, hey, these things might actually make my, my appointment be more efficient and go better. Can we make sure that they're in place for my next visit? Great, great. that's great advice. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question. It says to overcome the disconnect or silo mentality between re legal requirements and quality outcomes, how do you appeal to the health system C-suites need to avoid reimbursement penalties for patient readmissions within 30 days? Um, I will say that it's appealing to a few different things. Equity, appealing to uh, you know, you got into healthcare um, to to provide you know good quality care to take care of people. This is a population that you also need to pay attention to. So, from an equity perspective, um, I I do. We are um, seeing from some health systems that they are finding that providing accommodations up front is again making the appointments go faster, um, decreasing you know. It, these are rare, so it's a little harder with data, but also, but there is some evidence that suggests that it decreases like staff injuries because they're not like, for example, having a high adjustable exam table. So they're not physically having to, you know, manually lift someone onto a table. Um, there's again, patient errors or patient, like I've heard stories of people being dropped on the floor when they get improperly, uh, transferred. So some of those safe patient and handling um, um, outcomes. And um, and I, I'm a researcher, so I see it is a bit on me and my, my colleagues as researchers. We need to do that research to demonstrate um, improved outcomes. And, um, you know, it, we need more of that to, again, be able to hand to our, our, our colleagues in health systems to demonstrate, hey, we can decrease 30 day readmission rates. We can decrease, um, you know, hospital infections. We can increase our vaccination rates if we do, you know, provide these accommodations. And then I think we not only have to provide that to the our organizations, but also the insurance companies and let them also make the case. Excellent. So, uh, we have another question uh, that has been asked, and it says, and it, this is going back to the data that we've been talking, that we talked about earlier, and it's like, who who is collecting the data for documentation? So, and I, I, I I'd like to expand that a little bit. I know that the, that we talked about data being um, included in the um, uh, electronic records. So, I guess the part of the question is, where does it go, and what difference does it make? So I would say um, it is lots of people in the health system. So I'm talking specifically about in the electronic health record. Um, but as we, as as the panelists have mentioned, it's best to have that information early um, in the encounter so you can the health the healthcare team can be prepared for the patient. So generally, registration, check in, scheduling. Those are the staff members who should be documenting disability status. So it's in there. Again, the team can be prepared. One thing I will say is we've really tried to separate out a um, documentation of disability status and a 
like a disability diagnosis. Um, and so that is, those are two separate things. And so you do not need a medical, like a trained physician or nurse to assess someone's disability. This is a self-reported disability um, um, for, again, tracking quality of care and providing accommodations. Some organizations are, um, uh, are integrating it into the patient portal so patients can go in and report a disability themselves. Yeah, this data is also being collected on the federal level. The Affordable Care Act required the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to include these disability questions in its federal health data collection projects. Um, that's not going to filter down to individual patients, as Megan was talking about having it in the medical record, but it's an important source of information because it helps us identify health disparities and measure whether on a large scale um, our policies and practices are actually moving the needle and decreasing um, those disparities. So that's another kind of source where you'd look and that those federal data collections as, as well as patient medical records are places where researchers look to do research. So if it's missing in the, in the electronic health record, then it's missing as a resource for research as well as for individual patient care. All right, well, I think we have time for one more question. So, and this goes back to training and the, the, and the disability competency curriculum. You know, I know that uh, after reading your article uh, and some folks have mentioned this, so that, you know, it's starting to make its way into some of the educational realm for medical professionals. So what do you see in the future if you can have your crystal ball? <laughs> Uh, about how it might um, be more um, prevalent in the curriculum, in the um, education. What we're finding is that the medical students want it and that the healthcare system, the medical schools are more likely to respond to their requests for that than they are from ours as faculty member. And so we're having increasing uh, medical student groups focused on disability. We're having them lead the conversation. And I All right, so any other thoughts on that? I, I would just say I, I agree with Michelle that, yeah, we're seeing more um, in medical schools and it is often led by medical students who are, are asking for this curriculum and this content. Um, and I would just say, though, we need to make sure um, it, it goes back to structural ableism is that we can train our medical students, but then if they go into a health system that is biased and um, and they, you know, again, structural conditions are contributing to disparities, then um, then maybe some of that knowledge might go out the window. So we need to think about, again, all of the different stages of education, which is really tricky for practicing clinicians. There's, especially since COVID, there's a lot of burnout and stress providers. So how do we um, incorporate training, um, but also, again, helping people just do the right thing. Um, and that might be not sitting them down and saying, giving them an hour lecture, but maybe working into the healthcare environment, some, you know, kind of quick learning opportunities that they can, again, have some immediate successes with a patient with a disability um, and take that forward. I know one of the strategies my colleague, uh, Dr. McKee has started doing is, uh, developing best practice alerts. And so the, when an individual with a disability is seen, that the, the medical record, things will pop up about consider, you know, doing this uh, test because they're at higher risk of diabetes or heart disease or, or such. And so the just-in-time type of information and learning, um, I think, is another way that we can begin to integrate um, you know, that just in those best practices and those training. And on that structural issue to also think of training and education 
for everyone involved in the healthcare enterprise. Providers, of course, but also office staff who make the appointment, who could ask, do you need an accommodation? Or if they're asked to provide accommodation, would understand how to handle that in the best way possible. The folks who purchase medical equipment and help design physical spaces for large healthcare systems, right? If it's a structural issue, that means everyone needs to be aware of this uh, to really most effectively deal with ableism. And if it's uh, an equipment issue, there needs to be a resource directory about where accessible equipment, uh, testing devices, um, resources are located so that those can be accessed. Well, Megan, Michelle, um, and um, Elizabeth, I want to thank all three of you for your wonderful information today. It has been quite informative. And I know that uh, folks uh, on the line as well as myself have benefited from it. Uh, and we realize that several of you may still uh, have questions for our speakers or that you or you may have questions about the ADA. So if you would, you can contact your regional ADA center at 1-800-949-4232. And you will also receive an email with a link to today's online session evaluation. So please put the complete evaluation for today's program because we do value your input and we do uh, look at these very carefully. Again, we want to thank our speakers today for sharing their time and knowledge with us. And as a reminder, today's session was recorded and it will be available for viewing next week at adapresentations.org slash archive.php. Thank you again for attending today's session and we look forward to having you join us next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Very exciting. Thank you.